Good morning, guys. Dr. Anderson here, and I want to spend a few minutes with you talking about Epstein-Barr virus and specifically the lab testing and try to help you understand this. You are getting this video because you are now part of the EBV club. EBV is short for Epstein-Barr virus. Now, please take a deep breath. Do not panic. Do not start Googling. Do not try to figure this out all on your own. The very fact that you're here and that we now have some answers to what you've been struggling with probably for years should give you hope and reassurance. I also have found that many of our clients that we work with, once they get a diagnosis, they feel angry or betrayed that nobody's told them this before or tested before. Let that go because it will not help you heal. It just is not common knowledge, and so your previous doctors didn't know to even look for it. So let that go. The next thing I want you to know for sure about EBV is that you can help your body heal and recover, and everything that your body's been doing and the symptoms you've been experiencing are not your body fighting you and failing you, but your body's attempts to try to help you heal and protect from this virus. So as Dr. Kine said, where do we start? We start with mindset. We start with gratitude. Gratitude that you've found some answers. Gratitude that you're in a place where you can get help. Gratitude that your body can heal. And with that, we're going to just talk about the labs today because obviously there's so, so much more. But I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And I want to show you a few pictures to help you start to get a little bit more familiar with this virus. So the first thing that we're going to share, and I hope, oh my goodness, I don't know if you'll be seeing this or not. I hope you're seeing the virus. Um, what I want you to notice is that this virus looks a lot like coronavirus. Um, it, well, viruses are quite similar. It has all these little proteins on the outside, these spikes, and then the inner part of the virus. Um, you can read this information here, but a couple things I want to point out to you. This, this virus is actually part of the herpes family. It's actually called human herpes virus 4. And if you think of herpes viruses, if you have cold sores or know anyone with cold sores, you, you are familiar with a herpes virus. That's herpes simplex type 1. You're familiar with the fact that it can be dormant and it can reactivate when you get a cold sore. Well, this virus is in the same family and has similar characteristics. The other thing I want you to notice is that up to 95% of the uh, adult U.S. population, probably worldwide actually, has had this virus or been exposed. Now, you may or may not know that you've gotten sick, but at almost 9 plus, almost 10 out of 10 people have, have have this in their system. So that's the first thing I want you to notice. Next, I want to point out the resource that I've been learning from, the mentor, and um, someone who's helping me teach you how to recover from this. Dr. Kasha Kynes is a doctor of clinical nutrition and she has spent years and years and years researching this virus. And she wrote a book that's on Amazon, um, considered a bestseller, one of the few resources out there that is truly backed by science and research called the Epstein-Barr Virus Solution. I will also share with you a class that she did for us, an introduction to the virus. And she is helping us coordinate our 10 week EBV recovery program too. So that's Dr. Kine's book and the, the resources that we're using for that. Now, before we dive into, actually, I am gonna dive into the labs now. So let me dive into the labs um, and I wanna pull up another screen here. All right, we're gonna actually go to a graph right here. I hope you can see this on the screen. This is from uh, Dr. Kine's website called ebvhelp.com, and I'll show you her website in a second. But this graph, I think, is the very best way to understand these antibodies and the tests that we're doing for Epstein-Barr virus. Now, I'm going to actually make this a little bit smaller and move it to one side and open another document that you can see side by side, which is actually somebody's lab test from our clinic. And you can see that, so this is what your test results would, would have looked like. You may not have these exact same numbers, but we're gonna walk through this graph on the left, along with these numbers on the right to help you understand what does all this mean? Well, uh, from Quest, anything in blue with the, with the H um, beside it means that it's abnormal and the H means high. 
So we're going to start over here on the left side of this graph and look at each one of these tests and then we're going to look over here at how does it look on the actual results. So the solid black line that peaks the earliest, what this graph is ref representing is the timeline from when you first have an active EBV infection. Now when you have an active full-blown EBV infection, it's often called mono, although there can be other causes of mono, but infectious mononucleosis is considered the active first infection of EBV. Well, the first antibody that goes up, the first test that becomes positive is called VCA IgM. VCA stands for viral capsid antigen. And if you think back to that picture that I showed you initially, I'll pop that up for just a second. The viral capsid would be the outer part of this virus here. Okay, so it goes up first. It goes up relatively early, even within the first week usually. And it peaks within the first usually four to six weeks and then quickly drops back down to almost, not, well, basically to zero. Now here's the interesting part. This little part over here where it says years, this represents reactivation. This represents reactivation of chronic active Epstein-Barr virus. And you can notice that if you go into a reactivation phase, this Ig, VCA IgM can become positive again, but usually not nearly as high as a level as initially. So let's look over here and see, does this person have VCA IgM? It's right here, EBA viral capsid IgM. Well, the normal is up to 36 and her result is negative. She has less than 36. So it's a negative result for her or him, whichever case it may be. Um, so she is most likely not in the early active phase of an initial infection. That's the first thing we can see. All right, the next thing we see is that the, this dotted line goes up. That's called the heterophile antibody. Well, I want you to ignore that one. What the um, CDC says about the heterophile test, which is also called monospot, and if you've gone to a walk-in clinic, they may have done, in fact, I used to do these. It's not a very accurate test. It has a lot of false positives and false negatives, which means it can show positive, but it's not mono, or it can show negative and it is mono. So that's not a good test. It's not one that we run when we're looking for chronic or reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. But it is, it is a test that's run sometimes and might be helpful. The next one that we see, see going up is this pink dotted line. That is the VCA viral capsid again, IgG. This is a different antibody that starts occurring later. It starts appearing maybe in the first week or two, but it usually starts peaking around um, two or three weeks, four weeks maybe. And then what I want you to notice is it does decline. What I was taught and many people were told is that VCA IgG is going to stay positive and so there's no reason to ever check it again. Well, I want you to notice this curve here. It peaks here within the first four to six weeks of an infection, but it does not stay high. It continues to slowly decline over time. It, it can take years and years, so it usually doesn't ever go to zero, but it can go down. Now let's take a look at this person's results for VCA IgG. Hers are over 750. Well, Quest doesn't report values over 750. So we do not know, is her level 5,000? or his level, or is it 2,000, or is it 800, or is it 750? Well, we don't know because they don't measure above, and a lot of labs don't measure above 600. In this case, it's over 750. All we know is it's over 750. Now, Dr. Kind specifically recommends testing all four of these antibodies on a repeated basis to see what your progress is. But here's the problem. If the first test is right here during a reactivation, and the level is 5,000, but all it says here is 750, and you test a few months later, and it still says over 750, but now maybe it's only 800. You cannot see the improvement in that lab because of the limitations of the testing itself. But it does go down over time. It peaks again if you have a reactivation, and then it can go back down again, but it typically doesn't go to zero, which is why most people say there's no ten no sense to test these, but that is not true. Okay, next I wanna look at the blue one. This is the most important one to determine if you've had a reactivation, if you have chronic active Epstein-Barr virus, and the one most people don't test. You can see that it starts going up within the first two or three weeks, 
And within um, usually three to four months, it's going to be back down to zero. But notice over here, reactivation, you're going to see the early antigen antibody go back up again. We'll take a look at this result right here. EBV early antigen antibody greater than 150. That is a very high number. Again, the lab doesn't measure higher than that. Is it 2,000? Is it 200? We don't know. But this particular, well, all the tests I've done, I've never seen anything reported above 150. And a lot of people are below that. So they do report numbers less than 150. So I've seen people with 119. I've seen people with, um, you know, numbers in the 40s or the 50s. Anything above nine is considered abnormal. And this antibody does go down relatively quickly. So if it's still positive, you are in an active reactivated state. You're actively <laughs> reactivated. That's a little redundant, sorry about that. Um, and if it's negative, what if it's negative? Well, what that means is you're either in between cycles or you're past this reactivation phase here by at least three to four months. Okay, and then the last one we want to talk about here is the green one, which is called EBNA. That's Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen. If you go back to this picture again, I hope you see this on the screen, that's the nuclear stuff inside the cell. And this test um, does not come back positive until at least two months after an initial infection, and it starts going up. And it can peak somewhere, you know, two, three, four months after you've had an initial infection. Typically, the results don't get as high as the BCA IgG number, but they do peak and then again, gradually go down and rise again when you have a reactivation. So this particular lab, the EB and A test is 136. Again, that's a very high number. So when we look at all of this together, what does this tell us about this particular case? Well, first of all, we know they're not in the active phase right here because they don't have any VCA IgM, okay? What we do know, because this early antigen is positive, they're absolutely in a reactivated state and the VC IgA and the EBNA are both elevated. I know this is a lot of word soup, but I, but I hope that seeing this graphic right next to these labs is starting to make more sense to you. Now, I'm gonna close this for a second. Go back to, we don't need to, well, we'll just, we'll not save that, sorry about that. I'll just minimize it. Um, I'm gonna go and show you a couple other things. If you look up Epstein-Barr virus on the CDC website, this is the CDC website. They're gonna tell you a little bit under laboratory testing about these antigens, you can read it. You can see here, they don't recommend the monospot test. That's called the heterophile test. And they talk to you a little bit about interpretation. But what I want you to notice that's missing is chronic active or reactivated Epstein-Barr virus because they are not sure that that actually exists, but you know it does. So it's not necessarily very accurate to read this information. And here's a little bit more information. This is actually from the NIH. Now they are talking specifically about chronic active EBV, and that's what Dr. Kynes calls it. The short uh, term for that is CAEBV. You can see it right there. Well, I want you to notice that they say this is a very rare condition. Well, that is not what I'm seeing in practice. That is not what you're experiencing, and I want to explain why I think they say this is such a rare condition. This is NIH. They say it's so rare because if you scroll down through the page after you read symptoms and what, whatnot, diagnosis, they say that the only test to diagnosis is called a quantitative PCR test. Well, what is that? That's a blood test that measures the actual DNA of the virus. Well, I'm gonna show you a diagram of the life cycle of EBV that will explain why this test is not accurate and why most of the time it is negative, which is why NIH says that chronic active Epstein-Barr virus is very rare. It is not very rare. However, 95% of the population who has been exposed or had EBV is not necessarily sick. You could have positive antibodies been exposed in the past and be perfectly well. That's determined by your lifestyle and your immune system strength. And that's the focus of our whole program and recovery is lifestyle and immune system health. So 
that's what NIH says about chronic active Epstein-Barr virus, that it's very rare. Well, we know that's not true. It just is not true. So I'm going to show you a picture of the life cycle of EBV and why the PCR test is often negative. All right, we're going to start over here on the left and go around to the right. At the top, this is what we would call the active initial or primary infection, sometimes called mono. They show tonsils here because often this virus, the EBV virus, comes in through the nose, mouth, or throat. It can infect epithelial cells in the nose, mouth, or throat, and tonsils are a good example of that. But it, that's why you get sore throat with it and nasal symptoms and all of that when you have an active case, why your neck and lymph nodes get so swollen up in this area. The virus invades these cells, and from there it transfers into these things called B cells. Well, B cells are part of your immune system. And this is where the virus starts replicating itself. It actually hijacks the DNA of the B cell itself and uses the machinery in the B cell to make more copies of it. It's, a, it's just evil. If you ask me, viruses are evil because they're, they're brilliant but evil. It's like, uh, it's like a terrorist crew going into a factory and telling the factory that now they're gonna make guns for the terrorists instead of ventilators for hospitals. That, that's a wild example, but that's kind of the idea of what happens with B cells. Well, in the active phase when you're sick here with the primary infection, the virus hijacks B cells and also goes into T cells. It replicates using the machinery, it replicates the virus, and it, it eventually, I'm gonna skip right over here to this pink box, it bursts these cells, releasing the virus back into the tissues, which is when you get symptoms again or you're contagious again. But I want you to notice what happens over here. Instead of bursting these cells, oftentimes what the virus will do is send out signals to the immune system not to kill these B cells. The immune system is so amazing that when it becomes infected with a virus, it actually tries to kill the cells so that the virus is no longer present and replicating. But the, the Epstein-Barr virus actually suppresses that signal. And so these B cells can continue to live in what we call a latent or a resting phase. The virus is within the B cell itself. Is it gonna show up in the bloodstream? No. Is it gonna be positive on a PCR test? No, but it is absolutely part of your tissues. Now we also know from research and, and from what I've learned with Dr. Kine's work and other virologists that she's worked with, Epstein-Barr virus doesn't just go into B cells, it goes into other tissues like thyroid tissue, nervous tissue, um, it can go into breast tissue, it can go into other cells in your immune system, and it can stay there dormant or resting for years. Now, what causes this reactivation? That is the million dollar question. And what we know so far from working with patients and, and learning from Dr. Kynes, stress is a huge reactivator. Toxins are a huge reactivator. Nutrient deficiencies, other infections, uh, there can be other things too, but that's why addressing your lifestyle and addressing nutrition and addressing stress uh, is so, so critical to keep it from reactivating. If you stay in this phase right here, which we call latent, you may not ever have symptoms again, and then you don't really need to worry about it. But when you have something reactivate, that's when the virus really starts, it ramps up replication, uh, it turns the factory up to full speed, and it starts releasing the virus back into your active tissues. And that's when you get all the symptoms, like brain fog, like joint pain, like sore throats, like extreme fatigue, even skin rashes, like your thyroid antibodies going way up. All of that, can be connected. Now, I don't wanna get into all the things that Epstein-Barr virus can do and is associated with. I want you just to understand this life cycle and why some of the tests are failing to show that you have the, the chronic active Epstein-Barr virus. I hope that this makes sense to you. Uh, I think that's about all I have for you guys. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Oh, I'm gonna go back, excuse me. I'm gonna go back to one more thing. Here's the graph again from Dr. Kine's page. I'm gonna go back and show you all of the resources on her website. So her website is called ebvhelp.com or EBV Global Institute. Where I went to, to show you that is about EBV. She has so much information here, so many free resources, you guys. I went to labs and diagnosis, but, and she has, I wanna show you this. 
She has some scenarios to help you understand your labs too. If you scroll down, she says, well, what about different scenarios? And if you want to, you can click on her video, which is about 45 minutes long, walking you through some of the tests I just showed you. Uh, but we're not gonna do that right now. She goes through the differences between these tests. You can click or open each of these boxes. Um, and she talks about, or she answers these questions. What if, what if this, what if that? So this is a really, really great resource. And she kind of shows you here what you might see with a reactivated infection. IgM will be negative. Your, uh, the, the other four will all be positive. So guys, I know this is a, a ton of information to absorb. If you are getting this at the beginning of your program, just know that we are here with you and everything we're gonna be doing through the first part of your program, at least the first two to three months, is building the foundation for your body to fight and heal from the EBV. Once you get through at least the first 60 days, we will dial it in and become even more specific. I don't want you to worry any more about it right now. Join the EBV, Thriving with EBV group to start connecting with other people and hearing about their stories and what you can do in addition if you, if you feel ready for that. And at some point, if you're ready, you can start diving into Dr. Kind's book, but it's very in-depth and very detailed. So I recommend doing that a little bit later when you don't feel so overwhelmed and you start to feel better because you will start to feel better. That is the good news. And I want you to take that away with you right now. You will start feeling better. There's hope, there are answers, and I hope this helps you understand your labs. We will go over it more at your appointment. And until then, be well and be hopeful. Okay, bye.